Good morning. How are you? Okay. Is it getting warmer outside? It was beautiful this morning, but still a bit chilly before 9 a.m. when I came for my first class. How is it now? Spring-like or not really? No. Okay. okay, we'll get there eventually. So this morning, I'm going to continue from where I left off last week, meaning that I intend to go through the notes that I posted for chapter two, explain the main concepts and ideas of chapter three of the first textbook, Peter Burke's What is the History of Knowledge? And also try to explain how especially chapter three may be relevant to your final project because yes, we are learning some things about the history of knowledge in general and how the knowledge industry came to be created. At the same time, we're working with digital tools that represent the incarnation, the interpretation of some of those principles related to knowledge. So a wiki or a free database, an app like Notion or one like Evernote are best used to execute a plan based on those principles. You, of course, continue to do the readings. Eventually, I will catch up with the readings, but you continue to do the readings as planned. I just want to add that since Friday, of course, I've been receiving uh, uh, invitation to uh, visit your page with the third assignment, the second written assignment on Google, entitled Google Me This. And up until Saturday morning, 8.39 a.m., I have responded, opening the pages, either sending a message back saying thanks, I received it, or opening those pages you invited me uh, to review and put in there a comment to uh, communicate that I had um, received uh, your link, that I was able to access the contents of your page. Then during the weekend, uh, I was busy doing other things. So I will resume reviewing the pages I've been invited for and confirming my presence. So if you haven't seen any confirmation from me, you can just wait until this afternoon. Or if you're worried, just send me an email and uh, I'll, I'll quickly go to your page instead of going one by one and include that confirmation, okay? And in fact, if you're still working on that page because the deadline for, for that, uh, no, it was not moved, right? No, no, I'm, I'm getting confused with the other class. The deadline was without any extensions Friday. But if, you need, if you're still working on it, let me know and let me know how can I help you to complete it more quickly, okay? So chapter two of the textbook, and by the way, if you're one of those few students who haven't received the textbook after you ordered it at the beginning of the semester, just cancel your order and get the electronic version of the book. You will save a few bucks and it's perfectly readable, perfectly usable. Cancel the order, get your money back, get the electronic version. So you, can, you, you don't remain too far behind the rest of the class. Chapter two introduces a series of concepts and terms and explains them, places them in the context of the development, of the historical development of knowledge. And you should have seen, if you, if you read this and, and try to get the whole picture in your mind, you can see that there are some patterns, right? That come out of the examples, out of the references to the history of knowledge. One of those, patterns that you see developing throughout the chapters from definition to definition, from section to section, is the idea that you have a bureaucratization of knowledge. 
that the organization of knowledge brings with it a kind of rigid structuring of the human individual and social networks that control knowledge right and and, and you see that reflected in the larger cultural movements that are reflected in today's societies in a society such as american societies with people trying to get out of the system trying to innovate from outside the system because the system itself with its rigid structure forces you into a particularly frame of mind forces your intellectual work to happen within certain frameworks and therefore creativity is stunted not to mention that some have uh, uh, brought to the attention of the larger public that after all with the exception and what a big exception but with the exception of hardware and software digital technologies on the hardware side the personal computer then tablets then the uh, smartphones and the digital technologies on the software side the, the software program the word processors of the 1990s the databases the excel like programs uh, etc with that exception not much innovation has been produced since the 1960s on there haven't been any major discoveries or other major technologies with the exception of uh, those software and hardware devices and their appendixes right because you what is the elon musk will tell you not that he is an automaker but that his business his core business is ai because he's not making cars he's not making electric cars his goal is to make self-driving cars that's really what tesla is about and that's how the other companies are still behind and, and it won't be easy for them to catch up it's a completely different model of cars and society is converging in their direction because once electric cars will be forced on the customers once you will not be able to buy a car that is not an electric car given the costs given the infrastructure etc society will switch from private ownership of cars to a system of a fleet of shared vehicles where you just call the car with an app sit in the car uh, read or, or do some work and the car is is taking you to your destination so I'm talking about this because you see this reflected for example when we talked about disciplines which was the last section I described and commented upon on Wednesday um, by the way let me are you able to read clearly from the back you want me to, to zoom in a little bit but let me see if the next thing is better Let, let's try this but I can change it again if you want me to so in reference to the disciplines I was saying this is where you see the administrative organization of the intellectual networks for example within academia so from the age of humanism the humanities you have the creation of multiple disciplines and the idea that each dis discipline is independent from each other and, and the biggest separation as i mentioned is of course theology religion separated from the other disciplines so if i study science i don't have to worry about god and of course galileo will try that at his own expense because galileo will say the, the bible is wrong and, and the church will uh, arrest him convict him and put him to uh, house arrest for for the rest of his life but the the, the basic principles will, will extend right machiavelli will say if you talk about politics forget about god forget about religion forget about the bible that's not the foundation of modern politics is not how leaders make their decisions based on the uh, universal principles of good
good ethics and morality, etc. At the same time, a university is an organization. A university these days is almost like a corporation. And so, for example, you see that disciplines are multiplied based on the need to place professors. Because universities do two things. They get your money to give you a degree, and they get my money to give me a place in academia. So some of you pay to get uh, better uh, prospects for an employment outside of the campus, and a percentage of the students will continue on to a master's degree, a PhD, a postdoc, and eventually be placed in academia. How do you place these many candidates because that is part of your enterprise, a core business of yours, well, you just multiply the disciplines. You just create more areas, more niches, right? You, instead of having a, uh, a professor of theater, you make that into a department. And then you separate theater into the stage, the script, the screenplay. The whole thing, the two things together and how they interact, theater and other arts, etc., etc. right? And you can repeat that not just in the humanities, which are kind of fading out, right? Uh, multiplication does not really apply to the humanities anymore. Shrinking is their game now. But it does apply to many of the sciences, OK? Uh, let's Vaughan. So when you look at innovation, the, you can understand the definition. What needs to be understood in the context of the history of knowledge is that at this point, from the 20th century on, really the beginning of the 20th century on, innovation is in itself a discipline. That is to say, you have scholars of innovation people who studied initially what Thomas Edison was doing, what Harry Ford was doing, to mention two very creative, very productive entrepreneurs who were able to revolutionize their industries. How do you systematize the creation of innovative ideas and innovative products? And one of the obvious question is, when someone becomes a successful inventor, when someone is successful at inventing something, is it really because of their talents, or is there a social and economic ecosystem that gives rewards people who are offering the skills, the ideas, the products that are in demand at that point, right? Because you know the stories, for example, the inventor of the Windsor only made $30,000 out of it, even though there are millions of windsurfers throughout the world, and especially on Long Island, because he invented the thing when it was not popular and didn't have time to wait for the thing to become popular and make money off of it. And that's the story for a lot of inventors. So the individual inventor is not as important as the ecosystem, as the context where they operate. And then, of course, you see for many of modern inventions, whether it be the automobile, the telephone, or the telegraph, um, the train during the 19th century and the earliest part of the 20th century, you see that there are centers of innovation, that it is never one person, even though you associate uh, the invention of the phone with Graham Bell, but Meucci, the Italian Meucci, was working on it at the same time. Some say, some say that Bell stole Meucci's idea, or take Galileo, who was uh, held responsible for the invention of the telescope, when we know that the telescope had been invented in Holland, and Galilei simply heard of this invention and based on the information, he never saw a telescope probably, but based on what he heard, he built one that was better than the inventions um, that, that the telescopes were being realized in Northern Europe. Okay, so oftentimes innovation comes out 
of different centers. That's why you call it a polygenetic nature of innovation. Polygenetic meaning that there is there isn't one place for the genesis of an invention, for the birth, the creation of an invention. It's always multiple people who will attempt and get close or even make the same invention, the same discovery around the same time. And then more and more in modern society, especially after Second World War, you find that inventions come out of groups and infrastructures, right? Uh, inventions will come out of academic labs, university labs, or R&D federal centers, or R&D private labs, etc. Okay, And a basic distinction can be made, it's a historic distinction between intellectuals and polymath. And an intellectual traditionally is someone who is engaged in some kind of social activity of social education is not limited to academia is not limited to the educational system but becomes a beacon of new knowledge for the entire society and uh, the term militant intellectual is the kind of terminology you would have heard in the 1960s and 70s in europe and the point of reference here the crucial event from this period is 1968 is the culture of revolutions of 1968 in France. And the, 19, the, the 1968 is one of those long years because 1968 for other countries, Italy, Spain, Mexico, is 1969 or 1970s when those ideas spread. But the basic idea was an intellectual cannot be limited to operating within an ivory tower separated from society, illuminating from the height of this tower just a few enlightened minds of their expert readers, trying expert readers because they have to decipher through their jargon what the ideas are. No, the intellectual has to be engaged in the reform of society. And from 1968 and the idea of militant intellectual you get to this day and the idea of the public humanities. The idea that even humanists are to be engaged in the changes that matter in society. The polymath is, is the Renaissance man, right? And everyone pretty much until the 17th century was a polymath. Even Galileo himself was not just an astronomer and a physicist. He was also an Aristotelian philosopher, the expert of Aristotle. He was also a musician. His father was a musician. Galileo was a pretty good musician himself. He was a literary commentator. He left commentaries of <coughs> canonical works, masterpieces, literary masterpieces of the Renaissance. So everyone during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was engaged in different fields. And basically there was little uh, separation between the humanities and the sciences. And then later, the, there is a big divide, right? But by now, and you go from the Renaissance man of the past, the polymath, poly means many, and math means matters, right? Many matters, many areas, many fields, to the hyper-specialists of today, right? So I do cinema, no, I don't do cinema. I just do French cinema. Do you do French cinema? No, no, no. I just do French cinema of the Nouvelle Vague from the 1960s. Do you do that? No, no, I just do Lelouch. And, and that's the descending into the uh, uh, hyper-localized kind of specialization. And I mentioned that as a humanist myself, but you can apply it to the scientific or medical health related disciplines that you frequent and understand what I mean by this kind of hyper fragmentation of the fields of expertise, right? And if you want, you can raise your hand and offer examples from the fields that you are most familiar with. Then, of course, what do you do? Once you fragment to death the uh, uh, cultural, intellectual environment, then you push interdisciplinarity. So for the last 20 years, it's been all about interdisciplinarity, which is an effort to 
have scholars not work within their silos, right? their enclosed discipline, but to restore the kind of dialogues, the kind of interactions among the disciplines that was normal 500 years ago or even 700 years ago, okay? And as I said before, look at the patterns. Knowledge management means I organize knowledge and I manage it. I approach that from a corporate point of view. And I think, in my mind, what is the most efficient way to man the resources, to take care of the resources, the intellectual resources that I have? And that's how you get to a university based on peer review, right? Peer review when you get tenure or when you get promoted to the next level from assistant to associate, social to full, full to distinguished, professor, etc. cetera, um, peer reviews of articles, et cetera, et, et cetera. But it's not just academia, right? It could be libraries. It could be labs that need to be managed. Whereas even in the 1930s, even if you go back to the big geniuses of the past, such as Einstein, or Richard Feynman, if you're familiar with Feynman, who had such a bright, creative mind, they would have struggled getting tenure. <laughs> Einstein did struggle, right? He was working in a patent office, not in academia, when he was making his discoveries, his studies on relativity. So you have universities of the past being free-flowing, and universities of <coughs> the present being highly structured to make efficiency the, the key word, right? You have to produce a certain number of articles and then those articles are worth nothing. You have the big crisis uh, as it happened a few years ago with uh, some of the psychological disciplines whereby someone tried to replicate tests that were the basis for published articles in, the fil in fields of psychology, and none of the tests could be replicated. Those results were unique, and without replication, without repeatability, there is no scientific consensus, etc., etc. But why did that happen? Because you, you have a, an academic workforce, and then you tell them, you have to be productive, you have to be efficient, you have to give me at least two articles a year, at least one book every five years, etc., etc., and then you do have those, but what's the value of what's being produced? Well, whereas Feynman could go, or Einstein could go years without publishing anything, but their mind was working. Or to bring back a very famous example from the Renaissance, Leonardo was painting the Last Supper in Milan, right? Which was considered to be the best uh, uh, fresco ever made. The, the highest form of that, of the fresco technique. And according to Giorgio Vasari, a, an art historian who published a book in, in the 1550s, Le Vita dei Più Eccellenti Pittori, the, the, the lives of the most excellent artists, etc. According to Giorgio Vasari, one day, the, the head of the convent, uh, where the Last Supper is found to this day. In fact, they open the door because they use the room for as a, as a cafeteria. So at some point, they open the door, getting out a chunk of, of the fresco. Didn't care who Leonardo was. But the head of the, of the convent hands, and Leonardo is like that. And the head of the convent goes, oh, come on, I'm paying you by the month because artists were paying based on time. I'm paying you by the month. You, you're not painting. You're costing me an arm and a leg. I'll go to the Duke of Milan and complain. He goes to the Duke of Milan. The Duke of Milan uh, invites Leonardo. And Leonardo says, the head of the convent is a doofus. He doesn't understand that art is not a mechanical work. It's not manual labor. I'm not painting walls. I'm painting the Last Supper, which requires me to work with my mind. So even when my arms are folded, I'm working. In fact, that's when I'm doing my best work. And of course, the head of the convent uh, uh, goes down in history as, as a, a thick-headed man and 
Leonardo becomes the prototype of the modern artist who's not an extension of the artisan, but he is one of the intellectuals, okay? Same here. Of course, terms such as knowledge society, information society are very common, anyone has heard about them, and it's all about the development of the industrial process, the transition from industrialization, right, that started with the steam engine in the 17th century, to the post-industrial society, where you work not with material products, trains, planes, automobiles, dishwashers, washing machines, but you work with information, that's what you sell. Knowledge, that's what you sell, okay? Or any kind of service related to, uh, to that. And of course, when you talk about knowledge, even knowledge gets a structure, and therefore you have different orders, different systems of knowledge or learning or information, right? And knowledge is always related to a context. Of course, that context may be part of a larger context. And the hierarchies of knowledge always change, okay? Are you extremely sad or, or not with me at all? Feel free to interrupt or, or just busy with something else. Okay. Uh, and what is that contributes to placing something within this, a number of different hierarchies of knowledge in time? Well, scientific at some point from the 1960s on represented immediate elevation of knowledge. So even the humanities starting abusing the word scientific. This is a scientific study of Shakespeare. This is a scientific edition of Shakespeare's plays, etc. So based on the scientific understanding of philology, of the history of the books, etc., etc. And of course, whatever your hierarchy is, there is always an attempt to homogenize culture, but is it really a good thing to homogenize the systems of knowledge? Or, or can you keep them heterogeneous? And in fact, that might be better, more human or more humane. Within the history of knowledge, you have the history of practices related to knowledge, which could be considered material knowledge, right? So you have disciplines such as the history of reading. We know from studies from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that uncovered anecdotal evidence from the past that people from the Middle Ages would read mouthing the words. So even if they were not speaking loud, reading loud, they would move their vocal cords while they were reading, right? Simulating the act of speaking. And then reading became more visual later on, for example. You have the history of experimenting. Of course, the protocols, the procedures followed by Galilei when he experimented with metal spheres and how they moved on an inclined plane or he would hang them in the cathedral of Pisa, have them swing through the, the nave of the cathedral to uh, study the pendulum and the movement of bodies through a pendulum, or he would jump, dump uh, weights, things of different weight from the Tower of Pisa to see how they moved through air and how they landed. That's different from the kind of experiments we now deem acceptable, right? You have the history of the processes associated with observation, because we now understand that the observer influences the outcome of the observation. The observer becomes part of the context, especially in anthropology, but other fields as well, and, and the results are modified by that, right? So Malinowski, Polish uh, uh, anthropologist who worked in England and the United States in the 20th century, one of the pioneers of field work in anthropology, would go and study a tribe in uh, New Guinea, for example, and understand that, yes, it was necessary for him 
not to observe from the veranda, that was his metaphor, but to go down and mix with the people. At the same time, you come in close proximity, even with members of a tribe, and they modify their behavior. They make an their answers match their expectations of what you are. Because you are there, and as long as you are there, then the system of social transactions is getting modified through your presence. And another example I can provide is from linguistics, where a German scholar by the name of Rolfs, one of the founders of the history of language, the history of Italian language, went to southern Italy to talk to farmers, people in the rural areas, to map the dissemination, the distribution of dialects and their characteristics, right? And produce this series of volumes about Italian dialects, but then some of his findings were not verified, and we now know, even from anecdotal evidence, that sometimes Italian peasants who saw this big German professor, an important intellectual, come into their house to ask them questions, they wanted to please him. They wanted to be polite to him. So sometimes they would say yes, simply because he said so, not because their dialect was like that. Okay, so his findings were influenced by the nature of the interaction between the observer and the thing that was being observed through an interview, okay? And classification itself is uh, a, a practice that is being studied Right, and we'll talk about classification even in reference to chapter three. And uh, I, I put there the passage where the book mentions Foucault that uh, quotes from a, a, a book, a famous book about words and things and uh, about language and reality. Uh, Michel Foucault mentions the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges and a famous passage where he introduces categories of animals found in a fictional Chinese encyclopedia where you see on the same level real animals and animals that are being painted with a certain kind of brush. So real animals, fictional animals are part of the same classification because of course classification itself introduces possible worlds, right? Instead of mapping the world the classification can multiply the worlds, including worlds that are just possible, not real, okay? And classification is the key part of when you have a protocol for a lab, right? What kind of journal, what kind of log, what kind of language do you need to uh, comply with for your experiment to be valid? The same way we talk about management of the workforce as one of the patterns, the themes of this chapter in reference to the intellectual world. Professionalization, you may not realize it, but it's one of the issues of this time, right? There, there was a time when you didn't need to be licensed as a doctor to practice medicine, uh, not even. And, and, and then, of course, licenses were introduced in some fields, such as medicine, but then licensure became the common practice to all kinds of professions. Whereas in the past, you didn't necessarily need to have a university degree hanging on the wall behind you to be a professional in a certain field, right? And so professionalization need, means you need a degree. No, it's not enough. Now you need a degree and a license, right? So you pass exams at the university, then you pass exams elsewhere, because the university was not good enough. That wasn't enough, right? So whole, this, this whole organization is for nothing, because if you need to become a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a nurse, you need to be tested by another agency, by another organization and certified. A teacher, you need to be certified by someone else. Why? Really, why? Um, and affiliations, you need to be a member of an organization, but then if you're a member of an organization, you have a supervisory board that tells you, you are a member in good status. You are not a member in good status. You could be thrown out. You could lose your license. How do you use your license? Well, initially it was simple enough, right? If you're a licensed engineer, if you're a licensed doctor, malpractice will get you 
to, to be out, to be ousted of the organization to lose your license, right? You, you build a falling bridge, you uh, plan a faulty house, you lose your license. At this point, having an opinion that is different, not aligned with the organization you belong to and the supervisory board can be enough to get you out of the system and without a job, right? A dissenting opinion, uh, and the example that I had in mind when I uh, wrote that would be the example of an Italian doctor who before COVID, uh, uh, believe me, before COVID uh, was uh, 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 put under scrutiny by the uh, uh, supervisory board that grants licenses for Italian doctors for criticizing vaccines. I'm not talking about COVID-19, I promise. It's not COVID-19 vaccines. His position was, at this point, do you really need to vaccinate all Italian kids for measles and other forms of disease that are either disappearing or not really lethal anymore and can be cured when you fall sick? That was his position, his opinion. It's not like he was not giving vaccines to his patients, but that was enough uh, to uh, have him uh, inquired and, and tried and his licensure was uh, put into question. Then of course, COVID-19 came. He took the same position about COVID-19 vaccines and how he went, he was fired. He's not, cannot practice medicine anymore. But again, I don't want to go into the complicated politics of COVID-19, but you understand the conundrums. Yes? I say, especially like right now, not, not relating to COVID vaccines, but just the, the bureaucracy of all of these different organizations doing licensure. Especially like I'm an EMT, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to, to be an EMT in New yes. York so I can have a job because yeah. it's, it's a very high demand. And I'm licensed nationally, mm -hmm. and I'm licensed in other states. But because I'm not licensed in New York, I can't work as an EMT in New York. Exactly. Yes, yes. So you need to be retested when you move from one state to another. Uh, even within the United States, let alone if you move to, from Europe uh, to the United States. I'm Italian. Uh, I, I came after my university degree and my, uh, did a doctorate in, in Toronto. And uh, I, I was uh, seeing uh, other Italian friends on Long Island during the 1990s who had just come from Italy and studied medicine there. And they had to pass this difficult exam for them they were used to the Italian kinds of exams where someone will question you for an hour, for two hours, how long they decide, and then decide you're good enough. No, they had 180 questions at that time, uh, less than three hours, I'm sure. It was less than a minute per question, multiple choice, and they struggled. Some uh, uh, took two years to pass the exam simply because they were not used to the format. Of course, they were good in terms of competence. They were not competent in the format of the test. That was the issue for, for some of them. So there is a bureaucracy that is affecting your professional career. Whereas in the past, the professional could move from one country to another. This was common during the 1920s and 30s before the war. There was a lot of people moving around uh, from one European country to another. And really, word of mouth might be enough to get you customers because people would say he's a good doctor, a good architect, a good engineer, together with a degree. Of course, you needed a degree at that point. It was not like the 18th or 19th, 19th century when even without a degree, you could operate in some profession. Thank you for your contributions. Anyone would like to contribute the, the, the struggles with the licensure uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm also more familiar with teachers because I've worked with MAT students, students in the Master of Arts of Teaching, especially in the languages, Italian and other languages, but I helped set up the system at the university. Uh, I was part of the committee that established MAT programs in about 20 uh, different disciplines, even biology, history, uh, etc. So I know how difficult that process can be, 
including the fact that at some point, in order to be licensed as a teacher, you needed to pay Pearson Publishing, a private company, not even a state agency, a private company, to review a video of you teaching, and they would certify that you were applying the right teaching methodology. And of course, you had to pay hundreds of dollars to Pearson <coughs> On top of anything else, you pay at Stony Brook in terms of tuitions to finally receive that kind of certification. Whereas 30 years ago, you could complete a bachelor and a master, or even just a bachelor, find employment in a school and work on your master later on. And, and the, process, uh, the process of being certified and tenured uh, was much easier to navigate. So, situated knowledge is something that you found already in the first chapter, if you remember. Marx uh, and others uh, are, are, were pioneer in this idea, the idea that knowledge is always found in the context, and the social components, even the components that are external to the area of knowledge you work on, will influence that, right? So the way you think, the way you approach an issue will be influenced by your uh, social status, by your family, by your class, by the community or society that you inhabit, etc. And if you look at the global uh, stage, then you find the geopolitics of knowledge, meaning, yes, you have the internet all over the world, but is access to the internet the same here as in other areas of the world. And within each area, you always have some kind of center or centers and communities or people who are found in the periphery or the margins. Styles of thoughts are also connected to that. Tacit knowledge goes back again to something you've also found in uh, the first chapter, for example, when the first chapter was mentioning the Corel, the, the issue, the contrast between the artisans building the church, the Cathedral of Milan, the, 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 the huge monument that took 300 years to build, and a French engineer. And the French engineer wanted to prevail, wanted to dominate, because he said, oh, I'm, I'm qualified. I have the know-how. I have the scientia, the Latin scientia, the wisdom. And the carpenters, the artisans working on the scaffolds of the cathedral uh, had the arts, the technique, had the practical knowledge, and they wanted to say, your plans are wrong. Your plans cannot be put to work. You have to listen to us. And so, once again, it was a matter of not just competing knowledge, but the hierarchy of knowledge. You have scienza, knowledge, the knowledge gathered from formal education placed above practical knowledge, the practical knowledge learned by carpenters, bricklayers, which became part of their transmitted knowledge, right? Because every generation of bricklayers and carpenters would transfer their practical knowledge to the next generation. And of course, the conclusion was uh, sine scientia, Nil sine scientia ars est. The uh, uh, practical knowledge without science, without formal education, is nothing. Okay? Respect the hierarchy. Okay. Tacit knowledge is related to that. Tacit because it's learned by practice. Because when you go work as a carpenter, a bricklayer in the past, as an artist being apprenticed, right? Leonardo, we talked about Leonardo. Leonardo, as a kid of, of 10, 11, was placed at a shop of another artist in Florence, Andrea del Verrocchio. Do you think that Andrea del Verrocchio would gather the apprentices and say, this is how you draw the figure of Christ on the cross? No, not at all. These kids would have to observe, repeat, and then someone would say, no, that's wrong, don't do that, or do this, but it's a lot of this and that. Even linguistically, there are studies that were made in the 1970s and 80s about the language of carpenters while they were apprenticing someone. 
and the most common words were this and that, right? Because they were pointing at things, they were not explaining. It was show and tell, okay? So tacit knowledge is the knowledge that you absorb, it's material knowledge. You learn carpentry by observing and trying to replicate the work of a carpenter. Same with cooking, same with winemaking. Guess what? How is developing, how is a whole branch of AI, artificial intelligence, developing? You now find positions, not that many, positions whereby you are responsible for training a bot, right? Because it's so difficult to create a neural network in the artificial brain of a bot, but it's much easier if the bot can learn from you or imitate you until it becomes proficient. So same approach. Tools of knowledge, anything, but don't think just of telescopes or particle accelerators, right? Even the blackboard was a tool of knowledge. A big leap ahead, a big jump ahead in education. The Romans, instead of blackboards, they used wax tables. They, they had a board with some wax, beeswax, on it, and then with a stick, you could draw on it, and then when you were done, you would just press the wax and make it a blank slate again. Big leap ahead in education. Carbon paper. Does anyone here know what carbon paper was? I want to age myself. I want to yeah, like date myself. Several layers with like imprint with pressures when you're right on the top layer it copies it so it's a very thin piece of paper on one side is printed with, with the logo of the company on the other side there is ink a thin layer of ink applied so very delicately you take it out and of course every single piece of the carbon paper is separated by another by a thin almost transparent piece of regular paper, so you get it out, then you put it in between two pieces of paper, white paper, or three, you can have one page, carbon paper, one page, carbon paper, another page. You put it in a typewriter. This is what I had to do at the university. Then you type, and because of the pressure, when you type, the first page that you have in front of you is inked by the typewriter. And the pressure makes the impression of that letter go through one, two, or three copies. Of course, if you have multiple copies, then you really have to do this. But after all, I had this huge typewriter that my father brought from his state office because it was being dismissed. It was this Olivetti that was at least 30 pounds. Okay, so it was built like a tank. You could really pummel on those keys if you had to. Okay, but carbon paper was a tool of knowledge. Having multiple copies produced efficiently was a revolution in many fields. And then of course, personal computers or before that filing cabinet, etc. Traditions are part of the history of knowledge, right? It means that whatever you get from the past has some kind of influence and also it gets you situated. Traditions are a form of situation, right? Because through the tradition, you know where you come from, what your boundaries are supposed to be. And of course, those boundaries can be constraining or they can be liberating, right? Because you know where you belong to. Whereas with, with no boundaries, you uh, may find yourself lost, right? Some of the local knowledges are anchored to tradition and with globalization spreading, globalization is threatening the local knowledges. And translation is applied to knowledge. Translating doesn't mean to literally change a word from one language to another. When you translate, you have to mediate between multiple cultures, right? Because the same words and the same phrases don't mean the same thing from one language to another. They always mean slightly different things. And you have to understand the cultures overseeing the text in order to have something uh, translate from one system to another. So five minutes.
to complete this lecture with reference to chapter three. First of all, as I said, chapter three is your map, it is your set of guidelines for your digital project because it maps out the process of creating a wiki and the process that you can then apply to your specific research, to your specific uh, context. Let me move this and, and go to the board. And what chapter three insists on are four aspects of the creation of new knowledge in the cycle, where C stands for collection, A stands for analysis, B stands for dissemination, and A stands for application. Of course, you may have slightly different terms depending on the scholar of, of knowledge, but basically the same part. Now, the first thing to understand is that this is not, doesn't work like this. C goes into A, A goes into D, D goes into A. So from collection, you move to analysis, from analysis, you move to dissemination, from dissemination to application. Not at all, it's a dynamic process. You start collecting data, and then you analyze, and you go back to it. So, is my Google Assistant or someone else's Google Assistant? Okay. And from the analysis, you go to the dissemination, but the dissemination can prompt better analysis. From dissemination, you go to application, but then you go back, or even you go back to this. Talking about collection for a second or two. Collection means answering the basic question of what is relevant for this data set? How do you understand what is relevant? Is it a totality? It can never be a totality. Even though modern theories approach this idea that you need almost the totality of data. And the scientists of the past would tell you you need a qualified sample of the data before you begin the analysis. But basically, for a more free flowing process, you start with a matrix of what is relevant, right? And then you start collecting and analyzing at the same time, going back and forth because your analysis, your unpacking of the data will let you to lead you to refine the parameters for the selection of data. So through the analysis, you understand what kind of data are really relevant and what can be excluded, right? Once you analyze the data, you have to think of what is the process of packaging the results for best dissemination. In your case, you start entering data content into your wiki, you start analyzing, organizing, right? Some of this is part of the intermediate processes classification, which is something you can do with tags, right? Organization because that is conducive to better analysis. And that is something you can do with links and with the process we call transclusion, whereby you have one page inside another. Once you package it and you make it available to someone who, who's visiting your pages, then the kind of feedback you receive will tell you what to do about better classification, better collection, better analysis. And application in your case means what is that I can do with your wiki? Show me how your wiki enhances the experience of going through these pages because it's not just a bunch of website pages that I read and then in my mind I extract what is valuable. No, you have something that as additional tool is more dynamic. I will stop for now.